getting out to a market and actually getting to walk a building. It's, I think, one of my favorite things about real estate, getting to see an asset, where it is, how it fits into its particular niche. It's, it's essential to what we do. Welcome to People Who Perform, the Real Estate Careers Podcast. Each episode will bring you conversations from business leaders and up and coming stars in the commercial real estate industry in Canada. Our guests will share their unique career journeys, passions, and advice on what it takes to be successful in this industry. This podcast is brought to you by Highview Partners, connecting people who perform in Canadian real estate. I'm your host, Richard Costello, and I'm pleased to introduce Liz Vera Gillespie. Liz is a Director of Asset Management with Nicola Wealth Real Estate, a leading investment firm with over seven billion in real estate assets under management. Liz oversees a diverse portfolio of properties in both Canada and the US. Within the industry, Liz is an active member of Crew Vancouver and currently manages the mentorship program. Prior to joining Nicola Wealth in 2013, Liz worked at CBRE in Illinois, managing real estate for Fortune 500 companies, international funds, and institutional owners. Notably, before moving to Canada, Liz oversaw all operations for a 1.5 million square foot office building in downtown Chicago. Liz holds an undergraduate degree from the University of Iowa and an MBA from UBC's Souda School of Business. In our conversation today, we'll hear more about Liz's career journey so far, insights into the world of asset management, life at Nicola Wealth, and much more. Liz, welcome to the Real Estate Careers Podcast. Thank you for taking the time. Thanks for having me, Richard. So Liz, if we could start by rewinding the clock, can you tell us a bit about your early years? Where did you grow up? And perhaps what are those, uh, some of those formative influences? And also, how did you come to work in real estate? So I actually grew up in a northern suburb of Chicago and was a bit of a half-hearted student, didn't really have a game plan for where I wanted my academic career to go. And I ended up at the University of Iowa because I had played field hockey in high school um, and had the possibility of an athletic scholarship. Uh, Unfortunately, I had a foot surgery that went awry and that was the end of that dream. But at that point in time, I had sort of already established myself at the university. Um, I dabbled in a few majors, uh, had an awful lot of fun and realized that really the best way to get out of university with a half decent degree was to major in history and then potentially consider going to law school. So after I had finished university, I knew that I had at least a year before law school was a possibility. I needed to take the LSATs, apply, et cetera. Um, So I had gone to a 4th of July party in the town that I grew up and was telling everyone there that, you know, wasn't sure what I wanted to be when I was a grown up. And, you know, did anyone have any suggestions? And one of the gentlemen at the party at that time, he ran the property management group for, at that time, C.B. Richard Ellis in Chicago and said, you know, we might have some entry level positions. So I went home and wrote my very first uh, resume, sent it off to him, uh, went for an interview, and uh, shortly thereafter was hired as an assistant to two different property managers. And uh, I ended up taking the LSATs, scored decently, but by that time, I'd been in real estate for a few months and was like, you know, those LSAT scores are good for a few years, but this real estate thing is kind of fun. And suffice to say, almost 20 years later, real estate was the choice I ended up making. Yeah, interesting. Well, you were, you worked at CBRE for nine years, close to maybe more. But So how, how did your career evolve over that time? Well, I started out as the assistant to the two property managers, and quite frankly, that was an amazing introduction to the business. Uh, We had the gamut of property types uh, and ownership types. We had everything from high net worth individuals to major pension funds, our asset types. We had office, industrial, flex. Um, And what was nice with the different ownership groups is it meant that we had different accounting softwares, different reporting requirements, and What was particularly interesting was to see how each of these different groups looked at their real estate, what was important to them. You know, for the pension fund, they, you know, had their own set of criteria. The high net worth individual, it was generational wealth. So 
it was a good lesson in understanding that you really need to know what outcome you want. Um, and that helps to align your decision making, where you focus your efforts and your funds. So, you know, having started with the two uh, property managers, uh, after a period of time with them, I moved up and was promoted to an on site management role. From there, I had a foray into uh, facilities management as an opportunity to get a little bit more uh, operational and capital experience. And then from there, back to uh, larger on site roles. And you know, one of the things that was a uh, one of my father's adages was that like a plant in your career, sometimes you need to repot yourself. And I think one of the things that I love about real estate is that you always have the opportunity to take on new challenges. You don't necessarily have to change firms. You don't necessarily need a new title, but you're always having the opportunity to try something a little bit different. So, you know, I feel like throughout my career, I've done a lot of different pots. I'm curious to hear more about how you found the real estate industry in Chicago, Liz, and how it might have influenced you at such a formative stage of your career. Well, I think one of the most interesting things about Chicago is just it is a real estate town. Um, You know, it's the one touristy thing that I highly recommend to anyone who ever goes to Chicago is to do the architectural boat cruise. Uh, It's an amazing introduction to the history of the city. And also just you get to see a whole bunch of different asset types. Um, So, you know, in that perspective, Chicago is a great place to work because you have the downtown core. You have um, a major industrial market. You've got suburban office. So if you're going to be in real estate, there's the opportunity to try and be part of a bunch of different things. Um, So throughout my career, you know, I got to work with a bunch of different property types. Um, But I think the most formative part of my career in Chicago is some of the people that I worked with. Uh, You know, to this day, when there are situations that I need sounding boards or advice, there's still people that I worked with 20 years ago that are the ones that I go to and say, hey, you know, have you ever run across this situation? But uh, chief among them, and I think someone who really influenced my career in real estate and sort of my attitude of how I work with people. Um, When I took on that first uh, individual property management building role, uh, I was tasked with a property manager, a senior property manager to oversee what I was doing and to help guide me along the way. And Fred Tucker, um, he was an absolute legend. He, in the 80s, was part of the management team at the Sears Tower. Subsequent to that, had managed pretty much every single asset type there was, worked for challenging owners. Um, he was sort of the, the the odd property specialist at CBRE. Mm-hmm. Um, and he had this unbelievable knack of getting everyone who worked at a building agnostic of their role, you know, from the day porter to the security guards, the operating engineers, and made them understand the value that they brought to the building um, and that their contributions were valued no matter you know, how insignificant it might seem to some outside people. You know, it's uh, in the summer, he would have barbecues at his house and all property staff was invited. And it was just a great way to ferment this team culture. And it helped me see that, you know, for people to really be successful, you need to utilize the tools of all of the people on the property. So I think that was one of the biggest goals or biggest lessons, I should say, Mm -hmm. that I was able to take away from my time working in Chicago. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. Thank you for, for sharing that. And I mentioned in your intro before you before you moved to Canada, you, you were the GM of a, of a large office property in, in Chicago. So how did you enjoy working on a on a big single asset? You know, it was a unique experience. It was a building that was built in 1906. It had originally been a warehouse for uh, Montgomery Wards, which was, you know, a competitor to Sears at that time, a major catalog, and it was their catalog warehouse. Um, and you know, throughout the building, they had great pictures of when it was actually a warehouse, you know, people riding bicycles from department to department. Um, and what was interesting was just the different tenant types. We had ground floor retail, we had data centers, we had, um, you know, major tech companies. And so it was getting to see how a large scale building works and the creativity that has to go into it. You know, we had a a massive cleaning staff, security staff, um, engineering staff. And again, it was making sure that all of those departments were working together, that they had a department head who could work with everybody and help drive the success of the building. 
And it was just one of those things that, you know, we had some great team meetings. Um, one of our tenants was a, a major tech firm. And, you know, bu- being an old building, we didn't have a ton of elevators. But, you know, on any given day, we would have, you know, five to 7,000 people in the building. And so how do you move all those people throughout the building when you only have a limited elevator capacity? Well, one of the security guards was like, well, in the mornings, why don't we use one of the freights? And so he was like, we can make it the party car. <laughs> and it was this great thing where we actually, you know, we would do contests where people could submit various things and then choose what music played in the elevator. Um, you know, for this particular tenant that had the heavy elevator burden, we actually painted the inside of the elevator, their corporate colors. And it was just a unique solution. And it was it came from a security guard. And so it's acknowledging that you have people who are in your building every day that unless you take the, op- the time to talk to them and ask them for their opinion, you might miss out on some great things. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think the other fun story about this building is, again, how do we move people throughout the building? We had a tenant that they, um, they had one of the, the systems where when you check out at a convenience store, it was a reward system. And what we ended up doing is we utilized their system and we put iPads into the stairwells. And so when you would go up the stairwell, you could put your little toggle next to it and you would get points for going up the stairs. And when you got to certain point levels, you could get various rewards. And one of them that was actually our most unique and exciting reward was people always wanted back of the house tours. They wanted to see, you know, what the major mechanicals were that ran the building. And so it was a pretty cool opportunity to engage the tenants into, you know, bettering their health and taking the burden off our elevators, but also, you know, seeing what uh, we get to do every day. Yeah, that's very cool. Uh, it kind of leads on to to my next question. Um, I was kind of interested to understand, like, what some of the, the takeaways were from from your time in, in that in those roles, like being a hands-on PM in Chicago. Um, yeah, some of the takeaways from those roles and, and, and what do you draw from them in, in your work today? I think one of the things that has served me best in my career was my interest in and willingness to take on different roles. Um, you know, having spent time working as the facilities manager in a culinary school, you know, when I took the role, it was billed to me as one thing and it decidedly was not what it was billed to me <laughs> as, but it still was an opportunity to learn a different business type. And, you know, again, understanding what their desired outcome was helped influence how we chose to run the building. So, you know, again, taking those opportunities to try something different and not shy away from things you never know what a random situation is going to end up benefiting you. So I think, you know, again, trying different things has really served me well in my career. And then the other takeaway is that in each of these roles, I always felt that there wasn't any job in the building that I was, was above participating in, you know, like when the day porter went home at 2 PM, well, you know, the toilet clogged at three 30, I guess I need to go get the plunger. Um, and I think that endeared me to the day porter because he was like, you know, she understands what I have to do. And so I feel like I got a little bit more out of him. And for the security guards, you know, they needed a break. I'll go sit at the desk and greet people. It helped me get to understand the tenants and the different roles that the various people in the buildings do. So Liz, in 2012, you moved to Vancouver and started the MBA program at UBC. What was the motivation behind this this big life change, life decision? Uh, Well, uh, after 10 years in property management, I knew that I loved real estate, uh, but I knew that property management was not the role that I wanted to do for the rest of my career. And I also had seen brokerage and acquisitions and you know, while I enjoy being tangentially involved in a deal, you know, that day-to-day grind of deal making is not for me. Um, but asset management, I thought that was an extension of property management where I could take the skills that I had, but also do something a little bit more with it. Um, and, you know, as I'd mentioned earlier, I had been a bit of a half-hearted student, my first educational go-round. And this was an opportunity for me to really do 
do education and really knuckle down and do it properly. So I knew we were moving to Vancouver and coming into a new market and desiring to do a career change. I felt that this was an opportunity for me to get those financial skills that I didn't have or didn't formally have and to leverage my existing career with these newly acquired skills in a new market and find the role that I really wanted to be in. Um, and as part of the Sauter MBA, one of the requirements is that you do a summer internship. And I'd been researching the various firms in Vancouver that offered asset management and positions that I might be interested in. And out of the blue, Nicola Wealth, who then was Nicola Crosby, they posted an internship position. And, you know, nine years later, I'm still here. I guess it's interesting to note for me is that you left the US as a, as a general manager you had an MBA under your belt, but I mean, like you say, you made the decision to almost start from the ground up as a, as a research analyst with Nicola Wealth. So what was it about the opportunity that encouraged you to almost like take that step back and, and, and build it back up again? I think one of the things that I really liked when I looked at Nicola the first time around was there were six people working real estate. I, I actually was the sixth person. And at that point there were only two funds. You know, it was an incredibly small shop. They had a range of asset types in different markets. And when I went in and met with them, it was very clear that it was an all hands on deck sort of environment where, you know, if I had gone to one of the larger shops, I felt like I would have had to perhaps specialize or choose a market or a product type where at Nicola, I knew that I would get that breadth of experience in both market types and product types. So even if it didn't end up being my long-term employer, I'd have a much better sense of asset management as a business, uh, having actually done some of it um, or worked within that role. And I would then be able to leverage that into what I really wanted to do. Thankfully, you know, obviously it's something that I have managed to find success with here. Um, it also was a really good opportunity to work in markets outside of Chicago. It's one of those things where so many of the fundamentals of real estate transcend markets, but each market has its own little quirks. And the lesson there has been making sure that when you do work in those markets, finding those people in the specific market that can be those market experts and help guide what you're doing. Because yes, the, the fundamentals translate regardless of market, but there are things you need to know in each market to help you really be successful. So it was all a great foundation that I knew I could leverage and I've been able to leverage it here. Are you looking for a recruitment partner that understands your unique hiring needs and can truly represent your business to the market? When you work with Highview Partners, it will feel like an extension of your company. Our process is proven to help you find exceptional talent, which we accomplish by understanding your company's values and culture first. We then commit to a strategic plan, navigate any challenges, and find the candidate who fits the role and your company best. Together, we will help you build a winning team. To discover more about our services, contact us today or visit us at highviewpartners.ca. Liz, for anyone who might be unfamiliar, what can you tell us about Nicola Wealth Real Estate? Well, Nicola Wealth Real Estate is the real estate division of Nicola Wealth. It's the wealth management firm that focuses on high net worth families and individuals. In the early 2000s, uh, our founder, John Nicola, and some key members who are still involved with the, the funds today, um, they saw that there was an opportunity to invest in real estate and they started with individual asset purposes. Um, and then in December of 2005, they created the fund that was then known as Spire Canada, which is now Nicola Canadian Real Estate. And uh, they created an open-ended Canadian denominated fund to invest in assets across Canada. And from there in 2010, they created a US denominated fund uh, to acquire assets in the US. And again, in 2014, created the Value Add Fund that's a cross-border fund that invests in things with a shorter term investment horizon with a focus on development or repositioning. So we sort of, you know, straddle both Canada and the US and invest in 
all product types basically except for hotels so it's been uh, an incredible growth trajectory you know like i said when i started there were the six of us working on the two funds 750 million total between the two of them and now we're 50 plus people three funds 200 assets almost 20 million square feet and our acquisitions pipeline shows that we're going to do probably another billion 2 billion this year so wow. it's uh, been incredible to be involved with. And I guess just just high level, what what does the structure of the team look like? I understand you don't you don't do property management directly. So and you, and you you work in asset management. So like what are the I guess the, the divisions within the real estate team or the, the 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 groups within the overall team? So as we've grown, we've brought in more specialized groups. Um, so now we have, within asset management, we have a leasing team, we have an insurance team, we have an in-house development team now, we have a debt team that procures our mortgages, we have an internal finance team, um, we have obviously our acquisitions team, and we also have uh, some legal specialists who help us do all of our documentation. So we've gone from being, you know, six people who did absolutely everything to 50 who have more specific niches. Um, but it's been uh, an interesting transition to see how we have managed to take that small entrepreneurial culture and then grow it over time. Liz, how has your career developed over the past nine years with Nicola Wealth Real Estate? Well, I started off as the summer analyst uh, right as the firm was internalizing their asset management. And so my role had me doing everything from market analysis to organizing the numerous electronic files that had been transferred over to creating forms that would be used to liaise with the third party property managers. And it really was a unique opportunity to use the skills I had from my years in property management and then to layer in some of the financial knowledge that I'd gotten as part of my MBA. And from there, I've had the opportunity to oversee assets in multiple U.S. and Canadian markets, different asset types in each market. Uh, and now I still have a portfolio of assets, but I also oversee all of our analysts. And I'm involved with some of our business transformation, transformation initiatives, uh, you know, thinking how we can better use technology and our Yardi platform to track and use our data. So it's been a role that has evolved and will continue to evolve. And it's been amazing to see the growth of the business in recent years, as you've as you've touched on, just in terms of number of people and transactions. What do you attribute this success to? I think our growth can be attributed to a number of factors, but it certainly helps that real estate is such a popular topic in Vancouver. For the wealth management side of the firm, having real estate as an offering to our clients is a great selling point. And as they say, success begets success. So the investors continue to invest in what we do, which enables us to continue to grow. Um, on the personnel side of things, I think that Nicola Wealth as a company is a great place to work. On a corporate level, Nicola Wealth has some really unique offerings uh, for the employees. Uh, we actually get to avail ourselves of the services of the wealth management advisors. So, you know, these are the advisors that are working with high net worth individuals. And, you know, I'm just a average employee and yet I get to go in and they'll sit down and run me through the same financial models. And it's a it's, you know, financial advice that's unparalleled getting to see the same sort of scenarios that they present to people who have substantially more money than I ever will, it's, uh, it's really f very cool to see. Um, and then sort of beyond that, um, we are also able to buy into the funds that we work on. And I think that adds an extra layer of care to what we do we are investing in ourselves and it makes us incented to make sure that these properties are going to perform long term because this is what our future retirement is potentially invested in so it's a it's an extra thing that i think is a, um, a credit to nicola wealth that they allow the employees to buy in at levels that you know the average investor is not able to do so um, and sort of beyond that, the firm itself is incredibly philanthropic. Um, a portion of profits are set aside every year, um, and a committee of employees is responsible for uh, dispersing them. I'm actually on the committee, which is why I'm 
pretty passionate about it. But, um, you know, in addition to the large scale donations that we give to various charities, you know, they also support employees in their fundraising and donating. So, you know, if you're doing a ride or a race and you're fundraising, the firm will match the fundraising that you do. Um, Giving Tuesday, every employee could, uh, you know, donate up to $500 and the firm would match it. And I think that's a, a level of sharing the pie, as the firm likes to say, that, you know, a lot of firms talk about the good that they do, but they really at Nicola are trying to support their employees in sharing the wealth and making the world a better place. So when, when you're thinking about who you're working on behalf of, and as you've, as you've mentioned, in this case, it's, it's, it's Nicola Wealth's high net worth clients and investors in, in these funds, like to what extent does this and their profile influence your investment decisions as a company, like acquisition decisions? Uh, Knowing our investor pool absolutely influences our investment philosophy. Um, You know, Mark Hanna, who runs our group, one of his common refrains is that we're looking for, you know, to use a baseball analogy, singles and doubles. We're looking for the assets that are going to be solid assets with credit tenants that are going to perform with consistent cash flow. The way that our funds are structured, we have a monthly distribution to our investors. And, you know, the real estate market has been on absolute fire, strong rent growth, strong capital appreciation. But since a number of us have worked through some down cycles, making through sure that we're set up to weather the various head wins is a key concern. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen it, but MSCI has a great chart as part of their benchmarking that shows the total annual return broken into its income and capital components. And, you know, over time, the income return is relatively stable, while the capital return has some truly wild swings. Um, And so, you know, while capital appreciation is fantastic, we want to make sure we're setting ourselves up you know, to have that measure of consistency. And we saw this in the early days of COVID. And I remember in March, 2020, all we could say was April 1st, April 1st, who of our tenants is going to pay their rent? And, you know, we ended up weathering COVID with, you know, collections of rent in the upper 90s. And, you know, sure, there were the major tenants that sent out their form letters saying that they just wouldn't be paying rent. And there also were a lot of tenants who came to us and said, this is what my struggle is. This is what I need to make it through. And it was a really cool experience to be able to work hand in hand with our tenants, have them make the business case for what they needed, and then be able to work with them. And, you know, whether it was some sort of abatement and a lease extension, if it was a deferral program of some sort, you know, by and large, the majority of our tenants made it through COVID um, unscathed. And sure, there were a few that didn't, but... You know, those that we granted deferrals to have paid them back. And it's been a really interesting experience of how different groups treated COVID and tenant needs. And I'd like to think that we did a very good job of our fiduciary duty to our investors and managing their cash flow, but also making sure that we were doing right by our tenants, because unless our tenants are successful, we won't be successful. So it's a, a hand in hand process and it was a lot of fun to work through. And could you share some of the examples of the work that goes on in the asset management team? Like maybe some of the, the biggest lessons that, that you've learned as a group, challenges, successes, like give us an insight into, into the world that, that you live there. Well, our asset management group includes our leasing team and our insurance group, and we're a pretty fairly uh, tight-knit group. And, you know, once the acquisitions process is complete, the asset is turned over to us. And, you know, obviously it has an investment thesis, and it's now up to us to either bear that investment thesis out or, you know, modify it as necessary and make that asset a success. So, you know, to that end, we have a constant cycle of reviewing our assets. Uh, Every single month we have Um, meetings that are open to the entirety of the real estate team where we go through a portion of the portfolio. Every year, each asset is discussed twice and it's going through the KPIs, looking at the lease expiration profile, where we are in relationship to the debt expiry, and then always thinking, is this an asset we would buy today? And if it is, 
obviously we keep it and we keep going on. Or if it's not, you know, is there something we can do to transform it into something we do want to continue to hold? Or is it something that we should be bringing to market? Um, and if we can sell it at a value that's accretive to our NAV, then that's the plan. Um, and then on a more granular level, the asset management team, um, we actually have a meeting that we affectionately refer to as Beauty and the Beast. Um, <laughs> and so it's um, every month, each asset manager has to present two properties um, or two. It can be a property. It can be a property management scenario. It can be a tenant. It can be a lease deal. It has to be something happening at one of your assets. And one of them has to be a success story where you can share what went well and use that as an opportunity to tell other people within the group about something that did go well. And then the beast is something that obviously is not going as well. And it's an opportunity to leverage the experiences that the team has, because maybe somebody has seen this in a different market, or they've seen something like it, or maybe they have a creative solution. We have a team that has such vast experience that it's a great opportunity to make sure that we're leveraging off of the talents and skills that everybody has. So it, it's just a lot of fun. And, you know, everybody comes to the meeting with their slides and has a little bit of liberty with how they're presented. And it's a, a good opportunity for the group to get together every month. Um, and then really the, the biggest challenge we have now is just keeping up with the growth. Uh, good, a good problem to have. Well, it seems like um, as a, as a, as a company, you enjoy the, the acronyms and the and the, the the adages, the the phrases, because I I was watching Mark Hanna's year end review in, in preparation for for our recording, and I, I first of all advise anyone to to check that out. It's it's packed full of really in, interesting information. But he he mentioned the acronym BHAG, big hairy audacious goal. Um, so anyway, I won't I won't ask you what your team specific goal is, but. It kind of speaks again, as, as you've t touched on, like the culture um, at the company. So I guess given your tenure with, with the group, like how, how do you contribute to that culture? And also, how do you ensure that the, the spirit of, of that maybe original culture stays true as, as you do grow and, and grow so quickly? Um I think that within the larger Nicola firm, we are definitely known as hard workers who have a lot of fun and uh, are often a little little overly jovial. So uh, we've actually left uh, the offices where the wealth managers are over on Broadway and Granville. And we, as real estate, we have our own office downtown now. Um, and we certainly do have that uh, fun ethos. Actually, today we're having a, a master's putting competition. So after <laughs> we do our recording, I'll be off to do my putts. Um, but, you know, like you said, we've been growing so quickly. So we've had to be very conscious about how do we keep that small entrepreneurial culture. Um, and it's been a combination of making sure that we know each other outside of our little niches. It's if you know who the people you work with are and sort of what their skill sets are, you're more likely to, you know, walk down the hall and say, hey, you know, I'm placing debt on this property you know, can you give me the background about this situation and that situation? You know, the acquisitions guys will come over and be like, you know, we're buying this asset in this market. You know, we already have these other things. How are they performing? Is there anything that I should be including in my pro forma? So it's making sure that we're having that sort of collaboration. And then again, just on the keeping connected front, it's our culture is just having fun. So we have everything from a hockey pool, a football pool, uh, March Madness. We do a firm pickleball tournament um, where, you know, people dressed in costume. And, um, you know, sometimes it might even be just a random Thursday afternoon where someone goes out and gets some uh, beverages and snacks and we sit around the conference room table and just shoot the breeze. We all work incredibly hard. But if we're going to spend such a large percent of our lives at work, it should be a group of people and a place that you enjoy spending time. And, you know, Mark's always talking about what's the composition of the locker room, who's in the dressing room, who's on the bus. So we want it to be people that we enjoy being with. And that's when we're hiring. That's what we're looking at. So Liz, you've been a manager for a number of years. How would you say you've come about your, your leadership style and, and perhaps how has this evolved? 
I think a lot of my leadership style has just been influenced by the people that I've worked with and that I've come across throughout my career. I've had tremendous leader examples, you know, from Fred, who I spoke of earlier, and currently Mary Aubrey, um, you know, just they are in a class above the rest. Um, and then I've also had some truly terrible people that I've worked with. And I think it's partly, you know, learning from the good, learning from the bad, and trying not to mistake make the mistakes of the bad and to emulate the good. So, you know, something that I really dislike being micromanaged. So, you know, I like to think that the team has lots of autonomy, but they should always know that the door is open. And, you know, taking a page out of Fred's book, there are no silly questions. You can come with the, you know, something that you think is totally trivial, but you really have no idea what that silly question is going to spark in terms of a discussion. And, you know, the people that you work with have different perspectives. And so I think over time, I have gotten more confident in myself and my abilities, but I always want to be able to share the knowledge and the experiences that I've had, but to continue to grow and learn from the people that I work with. You know, the, the young analysts, they come in and they'll say, well, why do we do this the way that we do it? And I'll be like, you know, I don't know. It's just the way we've done it. And when you have that sort of response, it's like, maybe there is a better way we can do this. And with the data and the technology that they're so accustomed to using, we, you know, we have a new analyst who has come in and he's been like, well, why don't I just do this data table? And it's changed the way that we do things. So mm. it's being open to mm. new ideas and not being rigid and letting people be successful. And is there anything that you do, let's say, in your personal time that, that helps you be a better leader at work? Um, I am incredibly lucky to have a very supportive spouse. Um, you know, my wife might crack jokes about, you know, as she refers to them, cams and wrecks. Um, and she'll chuckle when we're out and I'll get, you know, muddled down in some mundane detail of a building. But having that person to go home to, to talk about my day, the things that excite me or the, you know, challenges that I'm puzzling through, having a perspective that's outside of real estate and doesn't come with any preconceived notions, um, just having that sounding board is great. Um, mm. And then again, I also have a toddler at home. So when I go home, it's bath time and, you know, she doesn't care what I did all day. She just wants me to play <laughs> with her. So it's yeah. just, uh, it's a good decompression and... I, I just, I like having the crazy pace of work and then being able mm. to come home and just unplug for a minute. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. So Liz, I mentioned in your intro that you're actively involved in Crew Vancouver and manage the mentorship program. Perhaps you could tell us a bit more about this and as a plug for, for Crew, maybe you can speak to the benefits of participation in this program. Uh, we actually just kicked off the 2022-2023 uh, cohort application process. So I'm reading the applications that are coming in. And let me tell you, the up and coming crop of, uh, you know, the next generation, they have some great skills to share. Um, it's a really phenomenal program. We pair mentees who are typically women who are relatively new to the industry, but we also get people who are potentially looking to make a career change, take their current roles to the next level. And then we pair them with more senior women in the industry. So it's someone who has 10 plus years of experience. Um, and I've really enjoyed it from the perspective of someone who's relatively new to Vancouver. It's enabled me to meet a lot of very dynamic women in the industry. Um, who do everything from development to asset management to acquisitions and to have those resources. So it's been this networking opportunity that, you know, I think when you just go to sort of a, a general networking event, sometimes it's hard to make those connections. But being in crew, you have the opportunity to meet people on a smaller scale and to make those more personal connections. Um, and, you know, like I said, it's not just meeting the senior meet leaders. It's also getting to hear the perspectives of the new new crop of, of, of women coming up. You know, they look at situations with fresh eyes, offer novel solutions, and it just really gives me a I'm excited about where the industry is going. So Liz, looking back on your career so far, and appreciate plenty, plenty, plenty more runway ahead of you, but what, what are you, what are you most proud of? 
I am most proud that I have gotten to just try so many different things. I mean, that's really what it comes down to. I 100% inadvertently fell into this industry and I didn't have family connections, didn't have, you know, really any, you know, ties to the industry and have managed to forge a path in both, you know, the United States and in Canada. And it's been a wild ride, but it has been so much fun. And I am just excited to see what continues to come. Well, that leads me to my next question. Like what excites you about the, about the future at Nicola Wealth? I guess with like COVID and traveling easing, I imagine you must, must be on the road a lot more or, or certainly will be. So yeah, like what, what are you looking forward to? I'm really excited to see where we go. You know, as I've mentioned, the growth has been tremendous and it's been great to be involved with, but I hope that I can continue to be involved that as we grow, we still stay nimble, but we're also having to put in, you know, more policies and procedures, but, you know, CBRE, they're a phenomenal company, but they have some, a lot of paperwork. And that's something that I want to make sure that we're putting in policies and procedures that help us have guide rails and guideposts, but aren't onerous. So it's making sure that we grow up, but we stay, you know, lean and nimble and fun. Um, and I think travel, travel's absolutely going to pick up. Um, I'm most looking forward to getting back out and seeing buildings. Mm. I mean, it's, we're a social industry and real estate, it's a tangible thing. And getting out to a market and actually getting to walk a building, it's, I think one of my favorite things about real estate, getting to see an asset, where it is, how it fits into its particular niche, it's it's essential to what we do. Um, you know, in the last two years, we've bought a number of buildings where I have seen them on virtual tour. You know, I feel like I've, I've walked around a lot of buildings, but I haven't actually walked them. So I'm looking forward to getting out there meeting face to face with the people who I only know virtually and seeing the spaces because, you know, how can you really make the best decisions for an asset until you've truly seen it? You know, you, you look at a floor plan, you look at pictures, you look at a walkthrough, but until you've actually seen the space, um, you know, it really helps you guide your decisions. Yeah. Well, Liz, final question and coming back to your advice here. So, what advice do you have for anyone working in the industry who would like to position themselves in the area of asset management, but I don't know, perhaps doesn't have the, the technical or education background? Like how, how can you bridge the gaps or develop the tools if you're not exposed to them in, in your current role? Well, I think it's about having as a well-rounded skill set as possible. I think when we've been going out to the market for various positions, particularly the more junior positions, we find that people either have an operational background or they have the financial background. So depending on what your existing skill set is, it's augmenting it with the skill set you don't have. So for the people who have the analytic skills, it's picking up that operational side of things. It's if you're going to make decisions about an asset and capital planning, it helps to understand building systems. You know, how does a building actually function? How is the HVAC designed? You know, what's the curtain wall? You know, what, what's happening with the asphalt outside? Um, it's all things that ultimately as an asset manager, you're going to have to have an opinion on. So having a basic understanding of that really will help you in your career. For those that have the operations uh, background, it's looking into what classes you can take to get the financial skills, you know, understanding how appraisals work, leasing, NERs, um, those fundamentals that are going to help drive returns. So, you know, are there classes being offered that you can take? There's, you know, so many online opportunities, you know, Sauter has their various programs. Um, it's you know, making sure that when you're coming to an interview, you have a good understanding of as much of the business as possible. And, you know, one of the things that we're starting to do is we have a really great group of analysts who by and large have that strong analytical background and they don't have the operational background. But, you know, I really want them to continue to have runway within the 
our company. And so they need to pick up that operational side of things. So we're rolling out what I'm calling building days. And what we're going to do is we're going to get the asset manager for a particular building or group of buildings, the property manager, the third party property manager, um, hopefully our leasing team as well, and go out and spend a day just top to bottom walking the building, opening up the mechanical rooms, you know, going into the electrical closets up on the roof, and just walking through the things that you see so you can walk around and say, you know, when I'm in this situation, this is one of the things I'm looking at. You know, when I'm outside, I'm looking at the landscaping and I'm checking this, this, and this, the elevator tracks. It's all the things that you pick up over time working in the business that, you know, I want them all to be successful because what's the best way to grow your team? Grow it in-house. They know you. They know what you need from them. And that's what I'd like to see as we continue to grow the portfolio. You know, I want them each to start just moving up the runway. Fantastic, Liz. Uh, really, really appreciate your your time and and your your thoughts into these questions and your advice. Um, I don't want to keep you too much longer. I want to want you to get back to your to your putts. Can't miss those. Um, but no, thank you. It was it was awesome. I think a lot of people will um, yeah will take a lot from this. All right. Well, thank you very much, Richard. I really enjoyed uh, being able to talk about everything that I've gotten to experience thus far. Thank you for listening to People Who Perform, the Real Estate Careers podcast brought to you by Highview Partners, a talent search and recruitment firm focused exclusively on Canadian real estate. If your real estate team is looking to find the best next hire, or if you're ready to make the best next move in your career, then reach out to Highview Partners today. Follow us on LinkedIn and visit us at highviewpartners.ca.